last year in terms of he was one of uh, Sam's uh, examiners for her PhD viva. Um, and uh, since then we've, we've managed to establish uh, some kind of relationship, I think, where... We're still just good friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like you're good friends with everybody, right? Um, where Ray's working more closely with Splice now, and, and we're absolutely delighted with that. Um, I don't think, uh, even for our European visitors, that I need to introduce Ray uh, at, at any length. And in order to try and keep us on some kind of time, I'm not going to. Uh, but I'm going to pass you over now to, to Ray and to uh, sport industry and industrial sport. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. Uh, this stems from uh, an invitation. I'm, Mike also got one for the forthcoming, we think it's forthcoming, Mike, about four years in the making now, the Oxford Handbook to Sports History. Uh, but since I actually wrote the paper, many things have happened. So this is more up to date than the paper will be when the paper ever comes out. <laughs> Right, what I want to do then is uh, synthesise the current state of play regarding three aspects of the relationship between sport and industry and en route suggest some possible avenues for research. So what we're going to do is look at uh, how the process of industrialisation interacted with sport in Britain, look at the emergence of sport as an industry in its own right, and then thirdly, something I've recently got interested in, the development of work-based or work-associated sports teams and clubs. First then, how did industrialisation affect British sport? Well, the first generation of historians who looked at this, scholars such as Malcolmson and Cunningham, believed that the Industrial Revolution actually had a ne negative impact on sporting activity. They saw that things like the, the violent human and animal sports of rural Britain, the ploughing matches and the hedge lane contests that demonstrated agricultural skills, and the fo football matches played over extensive areas of land, they saw all these as being incompatible <coughs> with industrial society, industrial location, or industrial work patterns. They felt that the demands of industrialists for a disciplined workforce, capable of working long and regular hours throughout the year, undermined the leisure calendar of the agrarian economy, in which you got intense bursts of activity at planting time, harvesting time, shearing time. But at other times, there were long periods of irregular work, which gave you time to play instead of work. Industry, they saw, reduced the amount of leisure time available. An industrialist joined with other middle class reformers to attempt to change the workers' attitudes to both work and leisure. Sobriety, thrift, order, and hard work itself were all part of this new morality of respectability, which they intended to impose on the working class. An encouragement and exhortation was strengthened by legislation at the national level to outlaw many blood sports and ban Sunday entertainments and at urban level to prohibit street football. The early, sorry, the early 19th century then first began to be regarded as a leisure wasteland. But that was 30 years ago. The growing interest in sports history and the consequent detailed examination of the early industrialization period has shown that many traditional sports continued to be played into the late 19th century. And there was apparently no leisure vacuum to be filled. In fact, Adrian Harvey's intensive study of the 18th and 19th century based on Bell's life led him to suggest that during the first half of the 19th century, a commercial sporting culture actually emerged. This is turning on its head the leisure vacuum argument. He also argues that there was a major expansion in sporting activity in Manchester, the cotton capital of Britain. In other words, there began to be seen a chronological coincidence between industrialization and the expansion of sporting activity. 
The conventional view now is that modern sport originated in the 19th century as a direct consequence of Britain's industrialization. And this is epitomized in Neil Tranter's quote, if you can see there. I'm not going to read it. I used to hate lecturers that read out this lot. <laughs> and it also saves time. <laughs> Put more succinctly by the European scholars, Burger and Gouget, modern sport was born in England at the time of the Industrial Revolution. So far, so good. But I think the pendulum has swung too far. The role of industrialization as a driver of modern sport is too often taken as a chronological coincidence or correlation without the causal relationship being fully specified. I find it hard to see how industrialization could have impacted positively on sport, at least in the time they're talking about. Possibly, you might argue, the same mindset that gave us industrial entrepreneurs, risk takers, gave us the same mindset that promoted sport to aid gambling. The version of sports that emerged from the public schools may have emphasized qualities of use for the industrialist, teamwork, obeying orders, discipline, but don't exaggerate it. Vita Lampada, sport was teaching the virtues of war, not of commerce. And the third point I would say is there's very little evidence, and I'll return to this in the last section of my paper, very little evidence yet of industrialists actively promoting sport until the last third of the 19th century. The real contribution of industrialization to the development of sport lay in the increased incomes and the increased leisure time that productivity brought. And despite some precursors in particular trades, this was a product of the late rather than even the mid 19th century and certainly not before that. Even if we can establish a link between industrialization and sport, we have to consider not working. Another view. Was there in fact an industrial revolution? Or at least was the one at the time the historians have been talking about. It's increasingly been recognized that the process of industrialization was a drawn out affair, one which only accelerated significantly with the widespread <coughs> application of steam power in the second quarter of the 19th century. The first factories were little more than a bringing together under one roof the handcraft workers who'd been in existence before. Even when power was adopted for mechanization, it was water power. It was limited to the areas where water flow was fast. And the cotton works on the hillsides of Lancashire had neither a significant influence on national economic production at the time, nor any real impact on leisure patterns of workers generally, or even in Lancashire itself. We've got to remember that even by the mid-19th century, 5.5 million of the 7.2 million industrial workers were employed in non-mechanized industry. Agriculture was still the largest employment sector. What I'm saying to you is there was still plenty of time and space for traditional sport and recreation to continue. Only when steam became the driving force for mass production did factories become less geographically determined and did industry begin to change the environment in which sport took place. You got increased urbanization, followed on from industrialization, and that lessened the open space available. The major impact of industrialization on sport came in its later stages as the widespread application of steam power vastly increased productivity thus enabling employers to concede to demands to lessen the working week for the labour force and also to pay them higher wages. And these are two major consequences for sport. First, it created a mass market for Saturday afternoon spectator sport. 
it provided the time slot in which the activity could fit and the money with which the spectators could pay to watch. <coughs> and second, and it's often ignored by sports historians in this sense, for those who prefer to be active rather than watch others play, the increase in disposable income allowed the purchase of bicycles and other sporting equipment. And of course, by this time, towards the end of the 19th century, the middle class attitude towards sport had changed. They now accepted that, if appropriately controlled, it could be a force for good in creating healthier citizens, rejuvenating the labour force and building character. But yet another change of view. Donaldson and Young have argued that modern sports actually emerged from developments in the early modern era. Didn't have to wait till industrialization on a large scale. They argue that many modern traits are evident from as early as 1450. That's 425 years before I say it happened. They spot things like sport became increasingly institutionalized by the creation and codification of rules, by the building of dedicated sports spaces, by European-wide trade in sports equipment, by the emergence of a professional class of athletes, coaches, and officials. And they also note that from the Renaissance onwards, the sportification of military exercises and the rise of spectator sport was popular entertainment and observable. What is not clear, I think, is whether the examples discovered are precursors rather than initiators, atypical rather than commonplace. And I think further research is needed before full support can be given to their view, quote, the weight of current evidence indicates that the threshold for the beginnings of modern sport, at least in some social classes in some regions, could be moved back before 1800. I think what can be argued is that some of the preconditions for the emergence of modern sport uh, originated before widespread industrialization, but that its actual takeoff required further stimuli. Um, Gutman, in his seminal work on the modernization of sport, saw preconditions emerging well before industrialization as a byproduct of the scientific revolution of the European Enlightenment. And Stefan Szymanski, also sees the European Enlightenment as the starting point of the roots of modern sport. He sees it in the new forms of associativity created at that time, specifically the club, which is the fundamental unit of modern sport. But none of this demonstrates that modern sport existed on any significant scale prior to the late 19th century. My final point on industrialization is that we've got to make some differentiations. We've got to differentiate between the interrelated but semi-independent concepts of industrialization, urbanization, and commercialization. Industrialization, no doubt, contributed to the commercialization of sport, but we've got to be aware that many aspects of sport were commercialized long before there was any significant industry. Cricket, <coughs> pedestrianism, Sam will explain all about that to you later, uh, prize fighting, rowing, and especially horse racing had a long history of mass spectating, profit-seeking promoters, paid performers, state money contests, and gambling. But the key fact, I think, is though, although Many spectators paid to watch from the grandstands or to be close to the action. Much of the commercialization of the time was associated with the sport. Beer, food stalls, itinerant entertainers, etc., rather than being of the sport itself. Mass spectator sport did exist before the end of the 18th century, uh, 19th century. There was intermittent often annual at best. Harvey <coughs> claims that there was widespread mass spectator sport by the 1840s. But when you look at its evidence, what does he show? He shows no systematic figures for large attendance. He produces a table representing attendances of over 1,000 people, which you can say was large for the time. 
for the 1840s. But this averaged less than 45 such crowds a year. I think that's scarcely evidence of sufficient effective demand for these to be more than sporadic occasions. The market was not yet ready for regularly scheduled <coughs> sports events. It wasn't until the economic benefits of industrialization filtered down to the mass of the population that a large and regular, regular meaning not an annual, weekly, a large and regular playing clientele could be relied upon for sports events. Moreover, mass markets for sport require not only spending power and time in which to spend it, but also a concentration of population and ease of access to the venues. This came with urbanization and the development of intertown, but especially intratown transportation. And earlier urbanization didn't fulfill that latter requirement. It's important to distinguish the influence of industrialization from those of urbanization, without which there would have been no sporting culture, whereby recreation was transformed into entertainment and became a commodity for sale. First, as I've already pointed out, it should be stressed that the early factories were not the large buildings that were associated with water-powered and steam-powered machinery, but merely places that gathered together handcraft workers. Second, although much urbanization was a consequence of industrialization, either directly, manufacturing centers, or indirectly, ports and distribution centers, other forces were at work, such as population growth, immigration, and agricultural change, not all of which can be totally attributed to the coming of industry. Right, secondly, I'd like to look at sport as an industry in its own right. Any work here must use Stephen Hardy's model. Back in 1986, I think it was, it's still not been superseded. Though Dill Porter did develop it a little in the companion to, to sports history. Hardy postulates three aspects to be looked at. The game form itself, and that becomes a commodity once people are prepared to pay to watch it. Services ancillary to the game form, such as creating stadiums, or stadia, I never know which, which it is, to hold the pay in public, and the media which advertise the events. And then thirdly, the equipment required to participate in sport. Let's look at these in a little more detail. First, I think, when you're looking at the, the game form, it would be useful to identify some aspects of the game product which is being offered for sale. There are several inherent differences between the sports product and the conventional consumption good. Sport is non-predictable. It's a product where result or quality cannot be guaranteed. There's no script, no template, no identical replication. It's not mass production. There is no homogeneity about sport. Even a replay of a cup tie with the same lineup of players as in the original match is still a different output. The result cannot be predicted with total certainty. And indeed, uncertainty is the selling point of the sport product. A maxim of sports economists is that the more unpredictable a contest, the greater the attendance is likely to be. Secondly, again unlike most consumer goods, sport is non-durable. Once played, a game or a match is over. It can't be stored for future consumption, except perhaps as a DVD, but the results known and the excitement is dissipated. The key point is then an appropriate time slot needs to be found in which the event will take place if attendances are to be maximised. You can't have home fans turning up to watch it at two o'clock and then the away fans come at half past six to watch a replay or something. Sports events are one-offs, hence the late 19th century importance of the free Saturday afternoon 
and earlier the time available in rural environments for the annual race meeting. Thirdly, sport is a complementary product. It's rarely sold to the consumer without being in a package with other consumer goods and services. Going to the event can also involve the travel product, the betting product, the catering product, and the alcohol product. And in fact, it could be argued, as I've suggested about early commercialization, that these products actually preceded gate money sport. Now, despite the substantial work that's been done by sports economists and economic historians, myself included, on the peculiar economics of sport, I think perhaps to the detriment of analysis on the sports product itself historically, it has to be emphasized that much of the business activity associated with sport can be classified as conventional economic behavior. There's lots of normal economic activity within sport. Sports related occupations such as groundsmen and equipment manufacturers, or the less specific sports ones of clerks, receptionists, salespersons, all of which are needed to get the game underway. And then secondly, you've got lots of what we might call normal revenue seeking economic activity associated with sport. The landlord who puts on a cricket match to get a drinking clientele among the spectators or the simple production of sports equipment. And what we can do, I think, is apply four economic concepts to analyze how promoters and others attempted to raise revenue. Commercial widening occurs when more revenue is obtained from traditional gate revenue sources. In effect, the business strategy is more of the same. So you play more games. And that partly explains the expansion of leagues. I can remember when the European Cup had about 12 teams in it. Make games more meaningful. The friendly matches give way to matches that are competitive with trophies at stake. Charity Cups and then later the leagues. Secondly, you have commercial deepening. That looks for new revenue sources, such as sponsorship merchandising, signage, media rights. And I think apart from adverts on some football stadiums, that seems to be relatively little before 1914. It's a, a post-First World War development. Thirdly, you have product, in, product improvement, which means modify the original sporting competition so as to attract larger audiences, either for one event or over a season. So you can establish new competitions within the sport. You can introduce playoffs for promotion and relegation. Or you can perhaps start playing on a Sunday, which is a taboo in the period we've been talking about. These add more events to the sporting calendar, but don't change the essence of the traditional game. So establishment of the county championship in cricket in the 70s, development of the football league in the 80s, and playoffs for promotion and relegation in the Football League, which occurred for six seasons in the 1890s. Product development, on the other hand, can drastically change the nature of a sport and the way it's played. In horse racing, the development of two sprints for two-year-old horses, rather than the long-distance heats. Or the, in boxing, the bare-knuckle prize fighting to exhaustion, giving way to gloved, time-limited contests. But again, I think most product development is post-1914, at least in the British situation. Now, all that I've been talking about there, then, is conventional economic behaviour. So, what are the exceptions on which so much, perhaps disproportionately so, attention has been lavished? Competing firms in the normal economy do not need to collaborate to make a product. But as was remarked many years ago by pioneering sports economists back in the 1960s, it's little eco economic use being world boxing champion if you've got no one to fight. Firms need opponents. The big idea, I think, has 
being the one that team owners might not be seeking to maximise their income or profits, and instead be looking to, to maximise what is labelled utility. In essence, they look to win as many games and trophies as they could, rather than concentrate on making profits. Within the parameters of not going bankrupt, utility maximisers will spend to get a winning team. This might attract more spectators, it might increase revenues. Profit maximisers, however, are well aware that profit is not determined by revenue. Profit is determined by revenue minus costs. That's the difference, I think, between the profit maximiser and the utility maximiser. Conventional businesses then might be concerned with <coughs> controlling the margin between outlay and revenue, whereas the utility seeker might be willing to spend, sometimes at the risk of insolvency, and that did happen, to try and produce a winning team. In conventional businesses, cartels are frowned upon by the authorities. But in some sports, cartels are seen as necessary for survival. Although on-field competition is the lifeblood of elite sport, unrestrained competition of it is seen as detrimental. If the richest clubs can afford the best players, they will dominate the tournament, and the results will become more predictable, going back to sport and predictability. If the uncertainty hypothesis holds, then overall demand, that is attendances for the tournament's output as opposed to an individual team's attendances, the tournament's output attendance will decline. So leagues tend to operate as cartels, a monopoly supplier of output. The idea then is to restrict off-field competition between the clubs. So this can occur with centrally enforced agreements. I've got some there. Distribution of revenue. The early years of the Football League, gate receipts were pooled between the two teams. Costs of inputs can be restricted. The maximum wage coming into football in 1900. Output. Fixture schedules with league games were given priority. You couldn't just say, we're not going to play you on Saturday, we've got a better offer for a friendly. And supply of inputs, restrictions on player mobility, the transfer system coming in, the two-year residence that you had to have to change counties in cricket. So that's uh, something about sorry, you get a handkerchief. That's something about the uh, peculiar economics. What about the ancillary activities? Uh, mass viewing of sport necessitated special spectator facilities and if you haven't read that have a look at it, it's an excellent book by Simon Inglis um, <coughs> it's not academically referenced it doesn't mean it's rubbish I think there's a big research gap here for work on other sports and facilities that are provided and secondly um, fair amount of work being done, there's still room, I think, for some more on the sporting press. Once the punitive tax on newspapers disappeared, then the time was right for the emergence of the sporting press. Initially for elite readers, gradually it comes down the scale, and by the 1890s you've got the green and then the pink and on Saturday, and all these sort of things. And all that, of course, is in addition to the gradual intrusion of sport into the daily conventional press. Thirdly, you've got what, uh, how to talk about the, the equipment manufacturers. They were more concerned, of course, with the participant market than the spectator one. And this market obtained a national dimension, I think, earlier than the spectator sports market, which remained for many years essentially a local or regional market. Supplying equipment was a profitable experience for many companies. Though, of course, many small craft oriented producers went to the wall when mass, technology, mass production technology came in. But just to give you an example, by 1914, there were 350,000 golf club members in Britain, and between 300 to half a million amateur soccer players, all requiring equipment of some form. 
the extent of this ancillary industry that's generated can, I think, be seen if you go through the advertisements in the various golf and football annuals of the time. <coughs> One aspect of sport as an industry that we don't know much about is employment. We know a fair amount on professional sportsmen, who are the minority, much less on the semi-professionals, and very little on those that worked rather than played. The umpires, the referees, the craftsmen who made the equipment, the groundsmen who sorted out the playing services. Mike's done something on trainers, Neil Carter's done something on managers and medicos, I've done a bit on golf caddies. If anybody you know, knows of anything else out there on employment within the sports sector, be pleased to hear from you. What must not be forgotten, in all this talk of economic factors, commercialisation, investment, human capital formation, is the role of agency in the promotion of sport, both for spectators and participants. This is an area, I think, wide open for research, as has been done here by, by Dave on swim professors and Sam on pedestrianism. I think several categories of investor entrepreneur can be identified. First, you've got what we might say the conventional businessmen seeking profits. Prime example here, going back to Simon Inglis's book, would be Archibald Leach. He was responsible for at least 46 individual stands and pavilions in Britain between 1899 and 1939. Now, football stadia and enclosed race courses might be irrational economic projects in being vastly underutilized. But the people who built and designed them were conventional businessmen. On a smaller scale were the golf professionals who just ran the shop at the golf club, and made their money from making, repairing, and selling golf equipment. Then you've got others who sought profits more indirectly, as well as the businessmen who patronized works teams as part of their industrial welfare policy, and I'll come back to that. There were the penny capitalists and wealthier organisers of illegal off-course betting. There were the cycle manufacturers who regarded the sponsoring of meetings and riders as a form of advertising. And there were those builders, caterers, sports outfitters who took shares in football clubs in expectation of contracts that would follow. Another major group of football shareholders who looked to benefit indirectly was the drink trade who hoped that fans would celebrate their victories or drown their sorrows in public houses owned by men who supported their club financially. And then transport enterprises expected to benefit from the sports passenger traffic and hence the extended facilities to football grounds and race tracks, <coughs> excuse me, occasionally also sponsoring races and the latter. Then you got those promoting sport, perhaps hoping to cover their costs, uh, maybe utilising profits rather than trying to maximise them. You've got the rentiers, satisfied with a safe return rather than a high risk, high yield investment. There would be shareholders who financed the Edgebaston County Cricket Ground, felt they were entitled to a fair return, but quote, their main objective was not to make dividends, but to advance the interests and position of the county club. Yet others were prepared to subsidise their local or county cricket team for reasons of civic pride, county allegiance or national jingoism, with no thought of sport being a commodity in the marketplace. And here I think we can look at maybe the founders of the Football League in England and the boards of the constituent clubs. These men, I think, were looking for what I call psychic income rather than economic rewards. They invested for civic pride rather than for rather than for their pocketbook. And I think you can find such non-profit maximising behaviour in many other sports. County cricket clubs were dependent upon revenue from matches, test matches involving the national team to stay afloat. And I've just done my usual trick of getting a page out of order. It doesn't have to change the nature of you. <laughs> uh, horse racing existed only because owners were prepared to treat it as a hobby rather than a business. 
I think you can say some upper middle class, some upper class and middle class expenditure can be viewed as consumption, even though technically it might be investment. The net cost per kilogram of the grouse that was shot in the Scottish moors must have been very high, considering the establishment, maintenance, and killing expenses. Clearly, I think, as in race, racehorse ownership, there was a strong social status element to the heavy expenditure involved. And other members of the middle class laid out substantial sums to purchase social exclusivity in their capital-intensive, land-extensive golf clubs. And finally, and I think more work needs to be done on this, there's the political promotion of sport. In Britain in the late 19th century, the development of golf courses and recreational parks by local authorities were part of a wider political movement in which the health and welfare of their electorates were served by the provision of municipally owned transport, utility companies, and I say, and sports facilities. Right. Finish my coffee, and then we'll go into the third section. Nobody's left yet. <coughs> work associated sport. There are three main strands of work associated sport. Work as sport, sport as work, and workplace sport. That's used at sport three times, work three times, two hours, and just one place. No? Right. Work as sport. That's related to the demonstration of work skills, as in many traditional rural sports, where participants were seeking employment or local kudos. The second, particularly professionalism in elite sport, has been the focus of most academic study. And the third, in which I'm going to finish my talk on, has generated relatively little interest from either sports or economic historians, but it is beginning to, to emerge. We know that in the 19th century, several philanthropic employers, including the chocolate makers Cadbury, Roundtree, the chemist Boot, and the soap manufacturer Lever, provided sports facilities for their workers. And this seems to have spread across a range of industries in the 20th century. I think the sheer scale of workplace involvement in sport demands attention, not only in terms of the numbers, but also the range of economic sectors that offer such sport. It wasn't just in factory industry. In London, by the 1890s, many of the banks, railway companies, banks were good in those days, banks, railway companies, insurance firms, and utility providers were offering sporting facilities to their employers, including employees, sorry, grounds, clubhouses, rifle ranges, boating houses. Now we can't be precise on numbers at this stage. Uh, some studies have been done where they've looked for names that have a firm or a company in the title. And what they've shown basically this in cricket and then there was um, eight northern towns, uh, I don't think those are showing huge numbers as a percentage. Significant, but not hugely significant, if we can say. Um, I think they are indicative of workplace sport not yet being a, sig a totally significant element of aggregate adult sport. We just emphasize the, the adult part of sport. The real era of workplace sport, I think, is probably the interwar years, perhaps extending up to the 1970s. Nevertheless, the pre-1914 teams can be seen as a precursor of what was to come. And I'm beginning to work in this area by developing the extant literature to create a typology to exist in the evaluation of the workplace as a stimulus to sporting activity. We have a lot of variables down one side, and these will include the type of business, the size of business, whether the initiative and later the ongoing management and organisation came from the employer or the workforce, what sports were offered, what facilities were provided, whether the sports were open to the wider community or restricted to the, the firm itself, what was the motivation for development and participation, and, as I'm a historian, the chronology 
of the development. And so far, I reckon there were two phases of workplace sport before 1914. The first is that of the philanthropic, often authoritarian, <coughs> paternalistic family firm. And here the provision of sport was often independent of other benefits. Now the start date of this phase is being pushed further back in time. When I worked on my book, uh, Pilk and Play the Game, back in the 1980s, the earliest reference to company sport I found was Pilkington's in the 1860s. Now, now Peter Swain, for one, has uncovered the provision of a bowling green and cricket field for the employees of Chadwick e Eagley Mills in Bolton in the 1830s. And another early example, again from Lancashire, was the opening of a gymnasium for workers at the Brookhouse Mills in Blackburn in 1841. I still suspect that such early examples are one-offs and that the takeoff for work sport was the late 19th century, but I might be wrong. This first phase ends, but you can't draw a strict line, there's always people going, going across, ends in the 1880s when joint stock company formation, more complex managerial structures, and increased labour milit militancy, including the rise of what was called new unionism, paved the way for a switch from the family firm caring paternalism to formal company welfare provision offered to workers as part of a long-term managerial policy beyond that of the market relationship of the wage contract. I'm still working on these, these time periods. I think another, the interwar period is probably another one, and then post-war till about the 1970s, and then things seem to decline. And it might be what's happening in the economy gets reflected in works provision. Work-based sport, is an unrewarding topic to research. Each case study is just another bloody brick in the wall. What is really needed is a collective research project where the wall gets constructed more quickly. And I think this ought to be done for two reasons. Such sport, especially in the days when there was no sports provision in state schools, might have been the way in which many young adults were introduced to formal organised sport. And secondly, another aspect that merits attention is that they offered sport to both men and women. We may find out that there was more female sports participation than we previously believed. Thank you for staying for listening. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, let's go for it then. There must be some... Uh... Oh. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Um, uh, a, a quick comment and a quick, quick question, which the answer may be yes. Um, um, uh, the comments about the, the, the uh, point that you were making around um, not knowing terribly much about workers in sport, for instance, and it's a, it's a reflection into the now, but one of the things that concerns me enormously around the discourse about employment for our students now is we know hardly anything about the labour process for the jobs that they're going into. I, I, I think it's a, a huge issue that we need to be unpacking both in, in contemporary setting and historically. Uh, but I want to get back to the point that you were making about um, uh, the non-predictable character of sport and it's the, 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 the fact that it's not mass producible. Um, to, to what extent is that there are a, a difference that we need to be alert to about, uh, uh, about the, a distinction between mass production of sport and industrial production of sport in this, in this late 19th century Europe? Did I say yes? Does that answer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you mean by mass production of sport? I think that's where I well, well, I mean, well your, your, your point there was that that uh, the sporting event is not mass pr pr producible because because every sporting event is discrete and distinctive. Um, I'm concerned that, that that if we aren't alert to a distinction between mass production of sport and and the industrial production of sport, that we may take ourselves into a position where we're not being clear about exactly what's going on here. Yeah, uh, I mean, basically, th this takes me into quality control areas. Uh, how do you keep the? I mean, you might say. Every game is different, but is the Premier League football better than 
conference football and how do you determine that? And I think this this is partly what the cartels do these days with the uh, promotion and relegation. In uh, United States, I think, Australia you'll be aware of, there's no promotion and relegation. Uh, and I think the quality control is the aspect of mass production I would, I would be focusing on. Gary? Um, I, that was a great presentation, obviously, but um, in terms of workplace sport, I totally agree that we do need to do more research. In, in just looking at um, sort of anecdotal stuff through my other research, you see that in Manchester, for example, um, the tram company had a number of different depots suddenly playing football around the same time, so obviously that's spread the sport. But my real point really is, um, when we look at the sort of evolution of sport, what I get from what you've said and what I sort of believe myself is the way sport develops is the story rather than finding the eureka moment that says this is the day the FA was formed, this is the day that... So, do you think that we as sports historians, perhaps because the nature of sport is about winners, losers, statistics, start dates, end dates, do you think that we spend too much time looking for those eureka moments and not enough to look at the general pattern? Yeah, uh, and I think one reason for that, of course, is if you get an institutional thing like the FA stuff, you get records. Yes. And I think, to some extent, we become victims of the archives that, that we utilise. And I, I think what's happening now, particularly with the digitisation of local newspapers, is we're beginning to learn a lot more about what was going on in sport that we, we were unaware of. So I, I think, yeah, we, we look for the Eureka, well, to make a name, don't we? And even I was the one that discovered that. And even when we're dispelling the existing Eureka moments yeah. and trying to say, well, actually, we found a game in yeah. this day or a sport, yeah. And the, and the evolution continues with <coughs> the creation of futsal or beach volleyball or 20 yeah. cricket. Or but, I mean, as an economist, I would always argue the first is not important. Yeah. It's the typical. Yes. And? Um, and thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, and, uh, People who say that usually then going to come up to the kill. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I won't. Uh, Especially in different Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> We're not like that in Denmark. It's, uh, I've seen I, the I, killing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we make plain from the, right from the beginning we are going for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I have a comment to you afterwards. Uh, I made a presentation yesterday about Matt Busby's housing program in Manchester United about this paternalistic element, so perhaps that could be of interest for you. But my question is, in Denmark, one of the scholars who has done early sports history says that the time when you shift to sport is when you go from the idea in uh, earlier activities that it was about avoiding being the loser. Games were constructed so one person ended up losing and that was very much reflecting society that you were trying to be part of the community. So it was all about avoid being a loser, dropping out. And suddenly this concept of finding one winner at the other end, that's the time when things begin to change and you can talk about sport. Does this in any way relate to something that you have found in these discussions? I can't say, I mean... I have. My view of sport has always been there are always more, many more losers than winners. Yeah. And so the losers have a commonality yeah. rather, rather than the ones that emerge yeah. as, as the but, winners. But he says the way games were structured was yeah. that you didn't end up selecting one winner. There was somebody who had failed, who had come last. So you only look at the person to scorn, you could say afterwards, to mm. push out instead of the winner to celebrate at I the end of it. I and think that's there's it. possibly something to be done looking at the children's games. Oh, the Opies would have done something. Yeah. Yeah. I think children's games in this country might be a, a fruitful avenue to pursue, to yeah. see how they, did they have winners or, or not? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. It was a killer. Oh, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll just, instead of saying it was interesting, I'll say how much I enjoyed it and agree with it all. I've just had, perhaps a word for culture, that um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the chap who a couple of years ago gave a talk about the nature of time, about how it's been ever more precisely measured uh, and, you know, life speeded up, mm. so that, what with the penny post and railways, so people had more time to, that they could pack in more things into their working week or into the Saturday afternoon. Yeah, and I think that there's two things occurring, Scott. One, of course, it's part of government's records 
once you've got a stopwatch, you can you can do things that way. But also, it, it, it tightened up the organisation of activity. If you said uh, match had to start at 2:30, it had to start at 2:30. Teams didn't turn up; they either lost the game or they were fine or whatever. Whereas back at the 18th century races, Mike, it depend on how long a lunch the stewards had, had sometimes. They all give it time when they start. But do they always start on time? Uh, yeah, that's why I think yeah, they yeah. always say time yeah. when they start. <laughs> I think the concept of time, um, obviously in Britain they always talk about when the railways came and so you had the same time across the country, which you didn't used to. You used to have towns would have their own measurement of time. But I think sport itself also contributed to a notion of time. Part of what you might say there on the early programmes. Jeff? Ray, can I just ask you to broaden it out a little bit? Um, you've been concentrating on features of the British sports business and so forth. Um, it's an exportable commodity to an extent, I suppose. Uh, and how do we explain the transition of, of these things into Europe and South America and so on? And, and, and do the features stay the same, or are they seized upon by more entrepreneurial South Americans, or whatever they might be, uh, to dispel the utility maximization and go for profit? Well, you could have certainly the case when it was exported to the North America. I think that certainly happened. Uh, but I would also take a different line first, which would say I really follow what. Um, and Tomlinson did and saying in fact sports not British you know they, they looked at 22 significant sports and found British roots in only seven of them so if we're talking about what happened in Britain it might be a totally different story elsewhere in Europe um, now question about the export of British sports yes I think uh, there's been a lot of uh, goes out with the the Empire but I think that, uh, there's much more work now being done suggesting that it was always not just adopted but adapted for the purposes of the, the receiving country. Uh, like your stuff, Malcolm, on West Indian cricket. Yeah. So I, th I think it's, a, it's, it's an interesting story and it's one that, that someone should do on a large scale. Uh, my, off the top of my head I would say uh, it probably went out the same but What's the time period before it changes and has an American accent or a yeah. Latin American accent? I don't know. Couple here, Paul first and then Mike. Uh, hi, Ray. I'm, I'm not an historian, so apologies if this seems naive, this question. But um, do, you have a, do you have an opinion on what you think historians in the future will be thinking about the period we're in now, uh, potentially a, a digital rev revolution? And it, uh, is there anything we can learn from the period that you've been looking at that we should be taking uh, on board well, now? <coughs> My broad answer to, to anything like that is that the, the function of the historian is twofold. One is to stop people abusing history and saying, making up myths. Uh, but the second one is, I think historians have a good role to play to remind people there's a difference between a trend and a fluctuation. And what might seem to be important today might be unimportant in two years. Time. But the trend of <coughs> happening is what we should be looking at. We're finished with my question then. Um, I want to offer an alternative look, look at this. I think I want in, in, in terms of uh, maybe the development isn't just industrialization. I think it's about gambling. I think gambling lies much more at the heart of sport than Mike has tended to talk about. And if you go to the 17th and 18th century, the whole notion of the match, which we now use all the time, is something you see in horse racing, you see in pugilism, you see in pedestrianism, you know, all, 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 those, all those early sports are about people putting up their own money or getting someone else to help them put up their own money and they're matching, they're matching horses, they're matching boxes. And betting, betting drives sport right through the 17th century, it drives sport right through the 18th century, and it continues to drive it for much of the first part of the, of the 19th yep. century. And you still see it in the late 19th century in some sports. But alongside that starts to change, the, the, the transition seems to come when uh, 
in, in the end, you're no longer putting up much money except your membership of the club and you're just playing the games. Uh, and in terms of football and cricket changes to this, uh, even boxing is now being organised more by promoters and things. So, so something seems to be happening in terms of notions of risk. Risk lies at the heart of sport. And, it right, and, and the gambling, in a sense, is risking your own money. And it's a, in a context where you've, 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 Britain's changing, it's becoming more commercial, it's more prosperity, and all the rest. So gambling lies at the heart. And, and what you see alongside industrialization, uh, commercialization, urbanization, is this changing attitude to risk. There's a new notion of risk around. And, 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 I, I, and gambling in sport then shifts out. And it, it becomes something that spectators do or even non-spectators in things like pool, rather than necessarily the play for players itself. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, in a sense, we, 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 see, we tend to see industrialization as a major driving force, and it is. Back in gambling, gambling is also a driving force. And now, of course, in the late 20th century and the early 21st, we're seeing it driving again, both in terms of more corruption in sport, we're seeing it in sponsorship by of the many of the Premier League clubs now by, bet, by gambling and betting companies. So, so there's a complex relationship here. And I'm wondering whether that needs to impact as well. I, think, I, mean, I, I fully agree. I mean, I would, I, I would support you totally. Gambling is what's, what started uh, sports development, without, without a doubt. And it's gambling that led to rules That's right. in sport. Because if you're risking your money, you want to make sure you've both got the same definition of what is a win, quite simply. Uh, risk on, I mean, there's, the risk is different, isn't it? Uh, the risk in business is, can be calculated much more. And if you win, it doesn't mean someone else loses their money. Gambling is an exchange of money. One wins, one, one loses. But it is an industry as well, because if you, if you, can, if you risk and you're, you're successful as an entrepreneur, somebody else is probably less successful, and may, you may drive someone else out of business. So whilst there is a risk there, it's still, there's still a, there are still consequences of it. A, a lot of the early risk, of course, was, was your venture companies going abroad. And that comes time of the Enlightenment, fits in nicely with what Gutman argues about mindsets of people getting in, involved in gambling. Yeah, I, and I agree with you, Mike. Okay, it's not always nice to end on a note of agreement, wherever we are. And that's thank Ray very, very much for that.